Alfaba brings us one that belongs in the category of, how did you not understand what you just said? Larger bodies require larger amounts of food for homeostasis. For most, eating smaller amounts of food will not translate to living in a smaller body. Homeostasis is about safety and survival, not a body doing something wrong. Stranded in the desert replies, So they need more food to maintain their larger bodies, but eating less won't result in a smaller body like... What? I wonder if we need more food to maintain ourselves as the start of a movement to demand food assistance for their larger bodies, given the horrendous food inflation we are all experiencing. A brief aside, did you notice the government claims that inflation is like 8%, but it feels like groceries have gone up 20% this year alone, and last year they went up another 20%? What the hell? Earth Rumble brings us something from somebody who apparently has never stepped outside. I live in the US. I've heard the stories of the supposed obesity epidemic. In reality, it doesn't exist. Yes, heart attacks kill thousands a year. But heart attacks can just as easily be caused by being severely underweight as they can by being severely overweight. I've heard the stories of fat kids, but it's been more than 10 years since I actually saw a fat kid. And according to the stories that I've heard, they're everywhere. Most people today are severely underweight. That is, 5 foot 3 and 96 pounds, when a person that's 5 foot 3 should weigh a minimum of 120 pounds. Kay Slay replies, plot twist, she's agoraphobic and hasn't left her house in 10 years. But seriously for a second, in my high school there was maybe one fat kid, and this is in a school of about 1,500 kids. Now I'd say about one in three kids are fat or obese. Naked Lobster brings us, Everyday diet culture takes us further from the light. They played Running Up That Hill on the radio, and afterward the DJ said, It's so great that Kate Bush is still out there motivating us to run up that hill every day. Phoenix Neymar replies, Well, then they certainly shouldn't listen to Climb Every Mountain. They would cry that Mother Superior is a self-hating fatphobe. Imagine having to be forced to climb every mountain, ford every stream, and follow every rainbow to find your dream. Dreams are obviously ableist. Why can't dreams be more considerate to those who got winded when walking to the mailbox? NSFW Access 1998 brings us, Do you know, some scientists believe that diabetes is a genetic adaptation, that people with diabetes have an evolved gene that would help them survive in times of famine. More research is needed to support this theory, but it's pretty interesting, right? Good grab. Type 1 diabetes before insulin was a death sentence before you turned 5. This has to be really dark humor, parody, or something. No one can be this dumb. Side note, it's possible that diabetes is a genetic mutation. And that is, in general, part of evolution. Unfortunately, evolution makes a lot of mistakes, and a lot of the genetic mutations turn out to be not good. Only rarely does a beneficial mutation occur. Evolution, fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, We'll select out the ones with bad mutations, in general, but not always. Common Eggplant brings us, The pursuit of weight loss is always rooted in stigma and oppression. Always! Beat the Rich replies, I just didn't want to buy new pants. I think we've all been there. Pants may be the only thing keeping us honest in this day and age. Canine Cotton brings us, what if health is a concept created to keep black folks out? What if health has always been an anti-black eugenicist project? What if black, fat, and disabled people are always already positioned outside of health, no matter how hard we struggle to find a home in it? Justice Avenger replies, You know what's really anti-black? Telling black people it's okay to be fat, telling them eating healthy and exercising is a form of racism, telling black people it's their culture to be obese and embrace it. All brought to you by a white woman on TikTok who wants to show how anti-racist she is. Skyhawk brings us something that made them lose brain cells. Brianna tweets, Walkable cities is a dog whistle for fat phobia. Quantum Count replies, Sir, you're implying that fat people can't walk? Isn't this fat phobia also? I can't believe people are really complaining about being able to walk from one place to another without dying in a car accident. What the fudge should I be called brings us. 80-90% to 90 of eating disorders begin with a diet. Jewish Space Medbeds replies, 
It's a bit like saying 90% of people with an eating disorder have had coffee at least once. Or, my personal favorite, most people hit their brakes before they have a car accident. He continues, might be true, but it's also entirely meaningless. Eating disorders aren't diets, and diets aren't eating disorders, no matter how mad you are, that other people are succeeding at maintaining weight loss. For people who constantly use correlation isn't causation as their blankie against the mountain of evidence that obesity causes disease and early death, they sure love their correlation when they don't mean anything. The Eggplant Runner brings us, so next time you see someone share their before and after weight loss pic, or you notice someone has lost weight, maybe just don't comment on it. No, I'm proud of you. You're an inspiration or you look amazing, because when they gain weight, they'll suddenly feel not good enough. Uninstall Internet Explorer replies, If someone shares an accomplishment, do not celebrate it nor congratulate them, because what if at some point in the future they don't top that accomplishment? Glad I'm not this person's friend. Fat activists seem to be all about hunting for things other people do solely for themselves and then telling them to stop doing it. Why the lack of focus on addressing medical discrimination, which unquestioningly does occur? Why is it always about how you don't want people posting before and after photos? Not everything is for you. Chance Revolution brings us one more post about the movie The Whale. I can't recommend in good conscience that fat people watch The Whale. I can't recommend that skinny people watch it either, since it reinforces the notion that fat people are objects of pity who have brought their suffering upon themselves through lack of coping skills. Dismerart. To be honest, I think it's really unfair that they feel those of us who have struggled with trauma-related binging, that they think our story shouldn't be told because of how it makes them feel. Love Dub Bunny brings us. My doctor thinks I'm having trouble breathing at night because I'm too fat. In other words, there's fat underneath my diaphragm. His answer to everything, lose 40 pounds. And if I'm not able to breathe and can't sleep, just call 911. I asked if oxygen would help and he said no. No solutions, just fat shaming. I don't know how I'm going to sleep from now on. Someone replies, ask him to give you a referral for a second opinion from someone who practices evidence-based care. Naked Lobster replies, Losing weight for sleep apnea is evidence-based care. Excessive weight changes the dynamics of breathing. Love Dove Bunny brings us somebody whining about their dietitian. So I went to a dietitian who, at face value, was not anti-fat, stating that I have multiple chronic conditions as well as ADHD and autism, pushing me to need help determining what I can and can't eat. Please then tell me why the reason for my visit in the system is labeled appointment reason obesity. When did I say I was there because I was fat? I only said I needed help due to my chronic conditions, all of which are not my fault. Even the acid reflux, which is the only condition that technically could be because of someone's weight, I've had since 12 years old. I'm so done. Alert Strength replies. ADHD person here, diagnosed recently and fat forever. Guess what? Binge eating disorder is a common comorbidity. Impulse control issues and low dopamine makes that eating disorder common in ADHD folks. So yeah, I've never been a healthy weight for my age. Over 100 pounds at 9 years old. Sounds like they've never experienced a healthy weight without all the issues that come with it before. Doesn't make the doc wrong with the suggestion. I'm losing weight with treating my ADHD and almost 40 pounds down from my heaviest. Almost regular obese instead of morbidly obese. Holy poop, have so many issues improved or gone away? Weight less acid reflux? Better sleep? Likely had apnea at my heaviest. No more tingly toes or plantar fasciitis. No more red spots on my legs. All signs of diabetes, even though my blood work was normal. Just holy poop, guys, the improvements. And I'm only one-third of the way to a healthy weight. It's just beginning. Dorkita brings us. Can we please stop telling clients with diabetes that they have to eat low-carb? Our brains and bodies need a lot of carbs to function well. When a person's pancreas doesn't work as well, this fact does not change. We cannot expect people with diabetes to eat low-carb, and the advice to go low-carb is actually dangerous and harmful. People with diabetes can still eat carbs. They can still enjoy food. They can still eat for all the reasons anyone can, including emotional eating, comfort eating, and pleasure eating. Let's stop putting unrealistic expectations on people with diabetes and treat people as humans. Hashtag carbs are life. Hey, I know this is crazy, but maybe when you're seeking medical advice, you should listen to your doctor? Nah, maybe not. Hori Puffleg replies, 
Purely anecdotal, but my boyfriend was diagnosed with diabetes a couple of months after the shutdown started. He immediately changed his diet to basically being loads of fruits and vegetables and maybe some meat and cheese thrown in. He didn't do keto or paleo. In fact, he even ate potatoes once in a while. But he was low carb, especially compared to what he was eating before then. The best part was that led him to feeling better and to start riding his bike every day. Within six months, his doctors took him off whatever meds he was on. Metformin, maybe? And after a year, he stopped checking his blood sugar after every meal. Because he was medically compliant and changed his lifestyle, he got his diabetes to basically go into a remission. He knows it can come back at any time, but he's doing his best to have the healthiest life he can, and I'm so frickin' proud of him. My point is that low-carb saved him from a future with insulin, and who knows what other complications. Side note, I don't think that's a low-carb diet if he's eating lots of fruits and vegetables. Maybe moderate carb, or kinda low carb, but not really low carb. Let's continue. These people willfully and knowingly push sick people deeper into delusions and into a deadly disease are reprehensible. Sara Art brings us. Before, trying to allow myself to eat what I want, but not too much. One scoop of chocolate ice cream. During, creating an abundance mindset. There's no such thing as too much. A pint of Ben and Jerry's an entire chocolate bar, four cookies, after. I can eat what I want and trust my body to cue me when to stop. A scoop of ice cream, a half a chocolate bar, and a cookie. Seems like their after is eating a lot of sugar and carbs still, and very little protein. Grumpelina. People eating whole bags of Doritos just wouldn't be a thing if bodies can be trusted to cue people when to stop. Delete Bowser History adds, This exact thing. What's in the image, I mean, is what I was repeatedly told by therapists when I was seeking treatment for binge eating. I'm still in treatment, but I just smile and nod when this comes up. I'm tired of trying to explain that an abundance mindset is what encouraged my binging to begin with. I finally freed myself from an abusive, restrictive household and could buy whatever groceries and takeout I wanted, so I did. It went on like that for years. My during phase literally would have never stopped if I didn't make it stop. Please stop telling me. I just need to immerse myself in food and stock my house with my favorite snacks and my body will cue me when to stop. Vodka Fairy brings us. Dear small fats, what straight size people did to body positivity is what you are doing to larger fat bodies, excluding them even in their own spaces. Dancer Girl. Excluding them how and in what spaces? Vodka Fairy brings us another one. Small fats are the only face of the fat community due to the proximity to thinness because as much as the fat community wants to believe that things have progressed, the only thing that's changed is the scale, not the body standards, not the fat phobia. Akimzolv replies, It's a really fascinating power structure. The small fats make up the majority and must constantly self-flagulate. To the larger fats, if they're going to gain social capital. The mid fats are, I don't know, Fat Upper Middle Management, it's a vanity title. Super fats have a big voice and clout, but that also means that they have the most to lose in their social circle if they ever lost weight. Infant fats are a mysterious small cabal that I guess have veto power in arguments. Caddy Bob brings us. Someone tweets, They're telling you that it's objectively not unhealthy to be fat, and it's objectively not healthier to be thin, because that's just a fact. It matters what you do with your body, what you put in it, not what your body looks like. Someone replies, And yet the Venn diagram of people who eat too much of the wrong things and the people who are obese, morbidly obese, super morbidly obese is a perfect circle. For those of you who've seen my early videos, I swear this tweet is not me. I used to do a lot of Venn diagrams and had to swear them off. They continue, This person who definitely isn't me, I promise. I know it sounds more like me with every second that I say it's not me, but it's not. Health problems might contribute to an extra 10 to 20 pounds, not an extra 100 plus. Stop trying to justify an unhealthy habit. They add, if you like food, fine, I get it, I'm obese myself. But this crap comes across the same way as a heavy smoker trying to sell the health benefits of tobacco to strangers. Dean Venture brings us five things that are part of being a normal eater. The first one, eating past comfortable fullness. They think that's normal? Going back for more. You know, that'd be fine if it was healthy food, but they show a giant stack of pancakes with butter and syrup. 
if you've already eaten five pancakes, you've probably had enough. Not eating a vegetable all day. I'm sorry, that is just straight out unhealthy unless you've got a serious medical issue that prevents you from eating vegetables. Honoring a craving. It shows one slice of pizza. That seems fine. Nobody's going to die from one slice of pizza. Eating out of boredom. Let's not normalize that. Kid Vicious brings us, The only way to be truly non-stigmatizing of fat people is to stop trying to eradicate us. Creating spaces that accommodate fat bodies and weight-neutral health care? These are anti-stigma actions. Co-opting the language of size acceptance in order to sell diets is not. Ugh, my name was taken, replies. The irony of fat activists complaining about having their language co-opted brings me a very odd sense of joy. Japanese ferret. The German language probably has a word for it. I think the English language has a phrase for it. Hoisted on your own petard. Dean Venture brings us. No one in the anti-diet space is saying health doesn't matter. We're saying health is not a moral obligation, has nothing to do with a person's worthiness, and looks different for everyone. We're saying all humans deserve equitable and compassionate care. St. Melangle replies, It's the equivalent of saying, I don't know, anyone's sobriety or financial job stability. Well, sure, but that choice has an impact on your family. I think Chidi would disagree with this, too. If you're not doing everything you can to take care of yourself, and yet you expect society to take care of you as hard as they can, you are not making a good moral choice. But I'm not Chidi, so I can't explain exactly which philosopher would support that theory. Auntie N brings us. The very act of intentionally trying to lose weight triggers your body's biology to fight you keeping it off. That part is true. When you try to diet, your body will go, hey, I'm hungry, stop doing that. That's why there's lots of diets and different tricks you can do to prevent getting hungry when you start to lower your calories. Your body wants to maintain homeostasis, status quo, and maintain a specific amount of fat to protect itself. This is your set point weight. Homeostasis is a well-known thing, and as far as I know, scientifically proven. Set point is not something that's been scientifically proven. It's just an idea some people have. It's based on the idea that if you eat healthy foods, your body will go to a particular weight. But once you start adding junk food to it, the set point idea doesn't work so well anymore because you can overeat on junk food quite easily. Then the person writes something with no scientific basis at all. Every time you diet, restrict food, or mentally restrict, your set point weight resets to a higher level to protect you from future famine. That doesn't happen. You overeat for a while and gain weight. That's why you gain weight. What the fudge should I be called? This is a conversation already in progress. The fat activist. From my own experience, that can be an eating disorder too. Ever heard of orthorexia? You think eating fairly healthy, home-cooked meals with no restrictions or binges is an eating disorder? Are you hearing yourself right now? It's literally what we should all be doing. There is so much problematic about this statement, because what does health mean exactly? Have you ever dealt with the fact that, depending on the time in the past, something else was considered healthy? I'm not just talking about the Victorian era when people, out of ignorance, actively poisoned themselves. Blah, 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 blah. They go on for six pages. I'm not going to read it all. Just imagine a whole bunch of crazy assaulting your brain and finding any excuse to not just eat healthy home-cooked meals. This person might have a new condition, which scientists haven't discovered yet, which is a fear of orthorexia. I guess it would be orthorexophobia. And that might explain why they ranted so much about such something so benign as suggesting people eat healthy home-cooked meals. Capable category brings us diet culture. Wrap your burger in a lettuce leaf to reduce carbs. The diet culture picture has a burger with cheese wrapped in lettuce. With half a plate full of fries. That's their diet culture version. Reality. That's a handheld salad and our bodies need carbs. Now it's a regular burger with fries. So apparently they think french fries have no carbohydrates in them. Whoever made this meme needs to go back 
and learn about nutrition. Because if you don't even understand the big three macros, you really shouldn't be giving any kind of diet advice at all. You need to know what fat is, you need to know what protein is, and you need to know what carbohydrates are, at the bare minimum. Because if you're not getting enough of fat and protein, you could be in for a world of hurt. Not Safe for Work Access 1998 brings us Diet Culture Lies. Sugar is addictive. Why do they always say that sugar isn't addictive? I have eaten foods that taste horrible and continued eating them simply because they were sweet. Here's a list. Ho-Ho's, I've eaten those. They don't taste good. Those chocolate donuts you get in a pack where the chocolate's kind of waxy and doesn't really taste like chocolate? I'll eat those, even though they don't taste good. Uh, Twinkies. I'll eat them. They don't taste good. And I'm sure there's more foods that I've eaten just because they're sweet. I just can't think of them right now. Am I the only person with this problem? If you've ever had this problem of eating something disgusting just because it's sweet, let me know what it is in the comments. Next lie. If you weigh less, you will be healthier. That's not exactly what diet culture says. Diet culture wants you to weigh a within a specific range because there's evidence that you tend to be healthier there and at a lower risk of dying. Now, the next, if you eat what you want, you will only want treat foods. This is kind of true for me. I'd either be eating only chipotle burritos or only donuts and cookies and things like that and soda. It would be horrible. My teeth would be gone within two or three years. I would not be able to brush my teeth enough to keep up with all the junk I would be eating. And I'd also weigh roughly 400 to 500 pounds if I ate everything I wanted, because my brain does not get satisfied from that kind of food, generally. Next lie. The more you exercise, the healthier you will be. For most people, this is true, but of course you can go to extremes and start injuring yourself by exercising too much, or getting too thin from exercising too much. And it's also true that there's diminishing returns. You get most of the productivity from exercise just from being able to run for one mile. If you just do that once a week, you've got most of the returns that you can get on exercise. Anything past that is a smaller effect. Much like when you eat vegetables, the first vegetable is way more important than the second vegetable you eat in the day. And it diminishes to practically nothing at around five servings of vegetables and five servings of fruit a day. Beyond that, you don't get any real health benefits. The next lie. If you eat less, you will lose weight. That's actually not the rule. The rule is if you eat fewer calories than you burn, then you will lose weight. At least fat. You might gain water. Who knows? But if you find that when you reduce calories, you're gaining weight, you probably have a medical issue. Titter brings us, Dear thin people, I know I've already said this, but it needs to be said again. These chairs are a crime against anyone with wide hips. Not only can our ample asses not fit back in the rounded part, also known as we can't rest our backs right, but the bars also jab our hips. Stop buying them. They're talking about the folding chairs and cheap plastic chairs that have a little thing on the sides to strengthen the back so it doesn't completely collapse because they're so cheaply made. But how, dear fat friend, can I best seat people in a large group, you ask? Chairs that don't have any arms or sides. It's so simple, the sturdier the better. And space them out a little so I don't feel like I've got a stray butt cheek invading in on someone else. And don't even think about these weak-ass pieces of poop. They're talking about the folding chairs that are made out of aluminum, or something like that. Their safe weight capacity is exceeded by like 30% of the adult population. Because 30% of the adult population is obese. Be an ally and think about this adventure. Cheaper is not always better. Thank you for your basic consideration of our humanity and dignity. They make a point, but they're ignoring the problems with it. First, stronger chairs cost more. And if they can't be folded, they take up a lot more space when you put them away. And if you're trying to get a certain number of people into a venue, you can't just space out the chairs as much as possible. Then you won't be able to get enough people into the venue. So while all of these things would be nice, strong, comfortable chairs that have enough space for everybody, but it's not really very realistic because that would increase the cost of everything. And perhaps there wouldn't be enough space for everybody. Also, it would require more storage space, which some places simply don't have. 
This is from Best of Redditor Updates, originally put together by Cherry Ding Dong. But the OP was, tonight, messed up. There's no trigger warnings on this one. Today I messed up by investigating the noise in the kitchen. So, like many people, I have a husband that usually sleeps with me at night. Tonight, however, he was out for work very late, and I just chose to sleep early. I got woken up by a noise in the kitchen. Being a pro athlete, I have many weights, dumbbells, English isn't my first language, scattered around my house. So I pick one up and go to investigate the noise. There's light in the kitchen, and a man in a hoodie is rummaging throughout my kitchen. I silently get closer, raise my dumbbell to hit him, and it's my fudging husband. I nearly pooped myself, and he is peacefully eating my share of the chocolate, looking like a homeless man who just broke in. I tell him so, asking him when did he get home, but no answer. His eyes are closed, no signs of consciousness in this man. I try talking to him, but he just sits at the kitchen counter and is taking whole bites of the chorizo, then two donuts, then chocolate, now the rice. He's downing a week's worth of food, and I am both in awe and worried for his well-being. Should I wake him? I have no idea what to do. Update. Up to now, my husband has eaten two-thirds of a rice cooker worth of rice, three chocolate tablets, a box of red lints, half a rotisserie chicken, that part's impressive, an entire cauliflower, raw, this was before I came, I found out after the crime was committed, four donuts that were meant for tomorrow's brunch with my sister, three bites out of her chorizo, a block of mozzarella cheese, Oof. he's not going to like later when he goes to the bathroom, three bottles of ginger ale, I tried, following a comment, to throw water at him, an oven mitt, I also tried talking to him and putting his alarm on, all from a safe distance. Mr. Ain't waking up. Yes, I filmed it. No, I won't be sharing it, as he had taken off his clothes and is currently butt naked, diving in a peanut butter. It would take a while anyway, as I would have to ask for his consent and censor it. Update. The husband is secured. Have you ever seen a grown man, butt naked, dipping whole bananas in peanut butter? I have, and it is seared in my memory. The broom didn't help. The ice-cold water didn't either. Maybe because he takes ice-cold showers in the morning? The pillow only got stained with peanut butter. I didn't wake him up. I just took him by the hand and guided him to bed. He's now secure, in bed happily playing with his... self. Man, do I love his stupid werewolf butt. Final update. Well, it is now midday, in the land of werewolves. We didn't sleep much because Hubby got quite sick and started vomiting not long after the whole pantry raid. I had to care for him. I showed him the video this morning, and his expression was, I am both in disbelief and extremely sorry for you. We laughed about it and thought it was a story we can't wait to tell our son. He was particularly laughing at him dipping unpeeled bananas into peanut butter to peel them right after that and eat. Such a waste of homemade peanut butter, lol. As many of you guessed, he was on sleeping pills. He came home late from work, but had to be awake quite early the next morning, and he couldn't sleep. So he took some of the sleeping pills my mom left behind when she visited us. The thing is, this is not America. This is the land of waffles. These pills? I don't have the words, and Google says tablet wand, are supposed to break in four different servings, and he took a full one. I don't have the name of it, as he can't find the box. Also, he would frequently sleepwalk and talk, walk and eat when he is stressed. We'd wake up to bites taken out of pizza, ingredients and fruits missing, etc. But this is the first time I've ever seen him do it, and I thought it was a burglar from the noise he was making. Question and answer. Sleepwalking people don't have their eyes closed. When I first saw him, he was eating with his eyes closed. He'd open and close them at different intervals, most of the time closed when chewing, open when looking through the kitchen. That's a week's worth of food for you? No, week's worth of snacks, as we don't eat that much and have very healthy diets. Chocolate and donuts are pleasures we consume sporadically. Was he on a diet? Yes, he was. Trying to get to the lower weight category, because he had a match and was worried he'd be over 90 as he had nowhere near that strength. His coach put him on a hugely restrictive diet of a few protein bars, boiled chicken, apple, and yogurt a day for like a week. He was looking forward to today's brunch. What are you guys going pro in? Swimming for me. I'm a pro swimmer, coach. He's a pro boxer and an accountant. Well, if he takes too many blows to the head, I guess he can kiss that accountant bot job goodbye. We also co-own a gym with my mom and stepdad. I think it's called Super Middle in English. Don't quote me on that. I know he has tried to drop 6 kilos in around 10 days, though. Posted by West Resident. Husband gets annoyed at me when I buy groceries because it's expensive. 
I recovered from chronic illness about one year ago, and I eat a clean diet because I'm sensitive to foods. It's expensive right now to buy things, so I partly understand his side. For eight months, I did all the grocery shopping by myself. He works less than me. But I work almost the same amount as him, and he's been doing some of the shopping to help. We eat pretty different diets right now, so I suggested maybe we go grocery shopping or by ourselves and separate our food, since we don't eat the same thing during the day. Today I came home with groceries, which was partly stuff to share and stuff for me. Immediately he said, do you think it's cheaper to separate it? What's this? Is that yours? So most of this food is yours, huh? Why did you buy that? Why didn't you buy this? All within five minutes of me walking in the door. I got defensive and immediately apologized and tried to hug him and he ignored me and said he has no freedom to speak. I feel bad. I don't want him to feel like that, but I don't want to feel like I can't buy the food I need. We make more than enough money to eat healthy foods. I want him to have freedom to speak, but it's his voice, the tone, the loudness. I just hate communicating with him. And I've tried to tell him. He triggers me a lot. Well, that's, that's not a good sign for a relationship. The food is just the tip of the iceberg, it sounds like. Here's something from unpopular opinion that I happen to agree with. From Shut the Fudge Up, Fanon. Watered down juice is tastier than full opacity juice. I wouldn't call it full opacity juice, but whatever. The full blast of sugar is overwhelming and nauseating. Adding a little bit of cold water and stirring makes juice way better. Yeah, but half strength is about best. Thank yous go to Emmett McNally, Rig, Cupcake or Death, MMC, Story Story, Megtran2000, Cly, That One Guy, Laura Christine, Maria P, Average Loser, Wolf Child Rusk, and Just a Girl for being top level supporters. And all of my other supporters, thank you to you as well. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe. If you really liked it, consider becoming a member. And to all you wonderful people out there, have a wonderful day.